So thanks for hanging in there, everybody. I um, welcome you. Thank you for being here. Thanks for supporting the Noya Center for Marine Science. And for those of you who are on Zoom, you know that there's a link there and you are welcome to, um, we love a $10 contribution to the, to the um, for our science talks, helps us cover the expenses of, of running these. And um, gosh, thank you, everybody. This, uh, I hope I didn't miss anything. This is a big deal to me this year in review. I kind of chug along all year and get out on the beach and work next to the ocean and get my boots in the sand. And then at the end of the year, I like to go over and review what has washed ashore along the Mendocino coast. And um, it's kind of baffling to me when I, when I take a look at it and go, gosh, if I look back in January, what was happening a year ago, January, there was these massive waves that actually what washed ashore was rocks and kelp and debris right across the highways. And a wave came right through the Point Cabrillo lighthouse. <laughs> All right, so uh, who and what has washed ashore in 2023? Um, this is... Uh, just a reminder that all marine mammal stranding activities were conducted under the authorization of NOAA Marine Fisheries Service through a stranding agreement issued to the California Academy of Sciences. So I'm working under the California, California Academy of Sciences permit through NOAA Fisheries and NOAA. Um, so we just like to remind folks if you're out there walking the beaches, whether you're doing a beach cleanup or just exploring around that it is not okay to pick up parts and bits of marine mammals if you're on your own. Um, if you <clears throat> pick them up and bring them to me, it's actually a whole lot of paperwork. So you can always call me and ask me to come out and take a look at whatever it is you've found. Um, all right, so who could wash ashore? And here's a picture of our odoriads. So the California sea lion, the stellar sea lion, the Guadalupe fur seal and the northern fur seal. So those are our four of our pinnipeds or seals that could, sea lions that could wash ashore on our beaches. Two that are more common and a couple that are less common and one that's very common, the California sea lion. And if we're quiet tonight, we'll hear them yelling from across the river because they are in the house. I think there's salmon, there's food and there's been a lot of sea lions around. <clears throat> And who could wash ashore of the phocids? So these are the earless seals. Um, we have the northern elephant seal and the harbor seal. Um, pretty familiar with the harbor seal here. Um, they're usually peeking at us right off the dock here. And the elephant seals are around. Um, we don't really have a haul out here locally. So people are like kind of surprised when they hear that we've got elephant seals. And then the other funny thing is that people think that when there's an elephant seal, it'd be one of those big ones with the big schnoz, because that's the picture we get in our mind about an elephant seal. But there's the little ones and they're about the size of a harbor seal. And this is probably in the picture here, uh, a yearling kind of yelling at us because we got too close. But they're quite common. They'll come and rest on our beaches. Um, and we do respond to a number of them each year. And then of the cetaceans, who could wash ashore along the coast? A lot of different cetaceans. So whales, porpoises, and dolphins, the gray whale, the humpback whale, the blue whale, the fin whale, the sperm whale, the beaked whale, orca, dolphins, and porpoises. And then there's a few more that would be um, more rare. I don't think I put minky whale there, but minky whale is another one. Um, so a lot of cetaceans out there. All right, so before I get rolling here, I'm gonna warn you all that there is graphic content coming up. And I always like to put the most disturbing graphic image here is the trash that is picked up off the beaches. And this is a collection I think from Kate. Um, she picks up these fishing line. Um, they even have a name. I don't remember what it is, but these little knots and nests of fishing line that get tumbled by the waves. Um, and I think most beach surveyors of which who are many are in the house and many are on Zoom, um, who are actually out there every two weeks, 
documenting what they see, picking up trash, um, and reporting deceased marine mammals. So there's a couple of graphic images for you, one of a whalebone and one of some trash picked up on one of our beaches. And then this is interesting. I thought to put in who has whitewashed ashore on the Mendocino coast um, since we've been a designee organization under California Academy of Sciences. Um, there's actually some that washed ashore that we know of that that be from before we actually became a designee organization. A fin whale in 2008 was up on Blues Beach. Um, and then in 2014, we had a minke whale on Jug Handle Beach, and of course, the blue whale, which washed ashore in 2009. And before that, I know if you go to McCarricker, you'll see the gray whale and the humpback whale skeleton that are out there. And through time, obviously, whales have been washing ashore, um, but now we're documenting them and um, really getting, getting more information from each whale that washes ashore. Um, and then here's 2014 to 2022. Since we've been affiliated with the with the California Academy of Sciences, we've had six gray whales, um, seven humpback whales, one killer whale, one sperm whale who didn't really wash ashore, as you know, <laughs> uh, a beaked whale and a minke whale. Uh, three striped dolphins, Pacific white sided dolphin, harbor porpoise, a handful of those, and then hundreds of pinnipeds. So the seals and sea lions by the hundreds. So here's some images of a few of those that washed ashore since we've been uh, reporting through the Noyo Center. Here's uh, 2023 so far. So this year we've had probably over 50 California sea lions. So that's a lot of California sea lions, more I think in one year than I've ever responded to. And that's true to for our people to the north of us at Cal Poly Humboldt State. They had a really, really busy year up there with California sea lions. And it's true to the south of us. We just got slammed. It started out to be a pretty mellow year, not a lot of animals washing ashore. And then come August, September, October, we got slammed. And I think that uh, to the north, Allison Louie said she'd never had so many in August. And that was pretty much true down to the south as well. Um, about 14 harbor seals, five northern elephant seals, no Guadalupe fur seals, yay. Um, two, just two northern fur seals, one humpback whale, and one harbor porpoise. And then, of course, I'd like to add that we got. Uh, <laughs> This is our beach response team, two of our interns and my fabulous assistant, Sarah Sundberg. We actually went down to the Marine Mammal Center this year and picked up the skull of a minke whale that had stranded here in 2014. And the skull had been down at the Mammal Center all these years. It was cleaned by Cal Academy and we picked up the skull and brought it and put it at the Discovery Center to be reunited with its axial skeleton that we've had for many years. Mm -hmm. So check that out. It was reported as a baby blue whale when it first came in. It looks just like a blue whale, but it's just, it's really small. So it's one of the smaller baleen whales. So uh, check that out at the Discovery Center. All right, this is from the north. This is Cal Poly Humboldt State, and their stranding coordinator up there is Allison Louie, who is a grad student under uh, Don Goley, and she's got the role that I have up there as stranding coordinator. And so here's just a picture of her territory, which includes the Lost Coast. So she's got a lot of area of coast that is inaccessible or really hard to get to. In fact, some of the areas of it you can only get to from from the ocean. So she spends a lot of time out on her boat. And we have a line in the sand, so to speak, between Mendocino response area and Cal Poly Humboldt. And I, a birder actually took this fabulous picture of a bear dragging a sea lion. We're pretty sure that this bear found a deceased sea lion. 
and actually was opportunistically feeding on it. Um, and that was in August. So the birder took the picture, posted it to Instagram. Somebody flagged me, and then I actually reported it to Allison because it was in her territory. Um, but really cool shot. <clears throat> so that was Matt Brady, a birder, who uh, saw that. And this beach is, I call it Bears Beach because I've actually seen bear tracks. It's that last beach before you head over the hill to Leggett. So right when you leave the coast, there's a little beach down there. And uh, yeah, I've seen bear tracks there. And here's this great shot. And then here to the south. So we have Sonoma um, County and Team Mendonoma. So that's a group from the Sea Ranch area and the Sonoma County area who respond to deceased mammals in the Mendocino Sonoma County, the very southern part of Mendocino County, like Wallala. And then further south, we have Sue Pemberton, who covers Marin and San Francisco and San Mateo County. She is actually the person that oversees and trains me. And uh, if I get something, if I take a wild guess or I'm not absolutely 100% sure I'm finding what I'm finding, she will definitely check me on on uh, how I'm how I'm identifying things, so to speak. An incredible teacher. And I think she is here on Zoom. She is here. We're gonna just see how this works. So Sue, I've got I'm a here. couple. There you are. Here I am. Excellent. So do you want to tell us about I don't you can see the slides. So you want to tell us a little bit about how your year has been? Uh, it's been a little bonkers, a lot of bonkers, actually. Um, some of it we expected, uh, some of it, a couple of things we didn't expect. Um, we kind of expect an uptick in, in uh, Calorinus or Sinus, these little northern fur seals, um, in advance of El Nino. Uh, and it's also not horribly unusual for us to get these tagged guys. So I thought I would speak for a moment about the value of research tagging and what it tells us about them, uh, about these animals as they live their lives. Uh, you'll see on both of these little fur seal pups, they're about five months old and they were tagged bilaterally, meaning on both sides of the front flippers with pink tags that have a number sequence that's one digit off from each other. Um, and um, I know who actually tags these. This is done, these tags are placed by the National Marine Mammal Lab uh, biologist down in the Channel Islands. Uh, one would think that th because these stranded in uh, Sonoma, Southern Sonoma and um, San Francisco County that they would naturally come from the closest uh, pupping area for Northern fur seals, which is the Farallon Islands, but they didn't. They came from Southern California. Unfortunately, they did not survive their trip up. They were very thin and very small, and it's not unusual to see a handful of those every year. Um, but if these guys were to grow and live to their full um, adulthood, uh, we would know their whole life history because um, people report these tags. We see more orange tags than we see pink tags. Those are a sign that an animal has been in rehabilitation. Um, there are other researchers who report them. So if you happen to find them, uh, go ahead and either let Sarah know so we can report back to the folks who placed them. Some of them come from Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Some of them come from different places and they really appreciate hearing back about tags or brands that people see in the wild. Wonderful, thank you, Sue, mm -hmm. for being here. And I additionally, Sue said between Noyo Center and California Academy of Sciences that we responded to about 525 marine mammals. Um, that's a lot of mammals on our coast that would otherwise not be documented and we may be, they may be lost to science. So this whole network, um, the West Coast Stranding Network is really doing some important work um, as we'll talk about more. Um, and then I think she had 200 this year. Most of those would have been California sea lions. Um, and... 
Did you want to say anything about the UME closing, Sue? Um, the Graywell? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah the, the Guadalupe first seal one closed a couple of years ago, uh, and we only had 29 in the state of California. I still keep track of that post UME tracking. Uh, there were only 29 in the whole state that, that either came into care or died. Uh, so it's been a quiet year, but let me, before I talk about the gray whale UME, um, I got a report from a, a pelagic birding trip um, off of point uh, uh, down south of, of Big Sur, uh, at Big Sur south of Monterey. Uh, they were out on a trip one day and they saw 70 live Guadalupe fur seals rafting out there, which is a highly unusual uh, collection of animals. And I was thrilled to see it and shared it with the whole network from Mexico uh, all the way up to the folks at the National Marine Mammal Lab who had been monitoring them as well. So it was, they're having a really good year and that makes me very happy. It makes us, um, those of us who were on the on the um, unusual mortality event um, committee for this species, very, very happy to know that they're they're thriving and doing well on the abundance of bait fish that's out there still because the humpbacks are still around down here. Um, with the gray whale UME, they're beginning the process of closing it out. Typically what these unusual mortality events um, try to um, establish is why a, a higher number of animals are dying. Once we think we know what that is, um, uh, then we can begin the, the process of closing it out. We're asking all the questions. It's a heightened investigation into why something might be happening. And it could be something like the uh, gray seals and the harbor seals over in, in Maine that were dying from uh, avian influenza a couple years ago, things like that. So once it's kind of established that we've run everything through the fine tooth of investigation, then they begin the, the long process of, of uh, closing the actual investigation and then doing post UME monitoring. So I'm happy to say that they are in the process of doing that with the gray whales. Um, Mo Flannery would probably be a better person to, to uh, speak to what they kind of found um, or didn't find with their investigation. She was on that UME committee. I don't know if she's on this call, but she might have a thing or two to say about that. I don't know if yeah. she's there though. Mo I am here. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> but I'm not sure if I have much more to add. Um, oh, I think over the course of the UME, there were 630 plus dead gray whales between Mexico and Canada. And <clears throat> we don't know the specific cause of death for all of them, but we saw a trend in body conditions. So likely there was something in the environment, lack of food that caused uh, more deaths than was usual in the past. Right. And we'll keep monitoring them over the next few years as part of the post UMA monitoring group. Excellent, thank you, Mo. And I yeah. guess we we did not have any gray whale strandings in our um, section of coast this year, so that's good. And there were very few in the um, in Sioux and Mo's region as well. Um, but just recently, I think there was one further south, and then very recently, uh, a couple more, right? So yeah, there was a there was a dead. Um young i think it was a yearling it was in the measurement the the length that we would consider a yearling and then uh there was a live one inside san francisco bay a couple of weeks ago which is kind of wild it's a little early for them to be transiting down to mexico um the other one you spoke of was a dead one that washed up down in um long marine labs um range which is santa cruz county and it kind of toured the whole coastline down there until it broke up into bits and and it got they got some samples on it but it was literally running from <laughs> from researchers it just kept getting washed out and washing further down the beach um, yeah. it's very strange but it does speak to the idea that we think that we have 
uh, gray whales that live further out at sea around the Farallons um, year round. So uh, there are folks working on ID catalogs for those so that we can uh, start matching some of our whales to some of these local whales that kind of stick around. Um, and the Marine Mammal Centers, uh, the cetacean field research, I don't think they call themselves that anymore, but uh, those folks are building a catalog of gray whales. So we're able to kind of match some of, even some of the ones that were necropsying uh, to um, individuals that they've seen in the bay. Um, and it's exciting science going on with them and in, in matching and creating these catalogs for different species of cetacean here in the Bay Area. Awesome. Well, thank you both for chiming in there. Really important to create that bigger picture of what's happening to the north and south of us. All right. Thank you. Um, all right. Here's what we saw here locally was uh, so many California sea lions. Like I said, um, not only did we respond to about 50 deceased one in ones on, on the Mendocino coast, we also had maybe, mm, I want to say 16 rescues of California sea lions, and most of those did not actually survive. So the rescues where we transport them down to the Marine Mammal Center, where they give them another chance at life. But these guys, by the time they get up here, they're often so sick that um, they don't survive treatment. But um, anyway, so it was a rough year for rescue work, which I do and many of our Noya Center volunteers do as well. Um, and uh, we just have a great volunteer team, but it was a it was a rough year for sure. All right. And the other things that stranded, just a handful of elephant seals, northern northern elephant seals, a handful of the um, adult subadult class harbor seals, and then just two northern fur seals. And interesting, strandings of interest. I always love this part. Two California sea lions that were actually females. And that's for this area, really, really rare. Um, I've had in my eight years of doing this, maybe one or two other female California sea lions. It's not to say they're not out there, but just that they strand and come ashore. Um, so we had one down in Wallala and one at Jug Handle. Um, and getting into the nitty gritty of it, this was a really rough response. Um, we went down, got a call from our team who surveys the Manchester beach and they came across a harbor porpoise, an adult female. And Sue could see right from the picture here that the belly was a bit poochy. And so she warned me ahead of time that it was probably pregnant and did the response. And sure enough, this was, she was not full term. She had a, a, a pretty small fetus there, um, but she was in great shape. She was round, she looked great. It was hard to see what was wrong. And then doing the sleuthing and the detective work like we do, we're gonna look at the, all the different things about this animal, what's going on. And I noticed this injury near the face, near the mouth of the animal. And then I saw something poking out of the mouth and it turns out it was a fish. So this girl had grabbed onto a fish head first, a rock fish with probably spines and whatnot. It would go in, but it wouldn't come out, right? And it had, her jaw was actually broken. So forgive me for this gruesome slide and gruesome scene, but, um, and there's the little fetus you can see in my hands, really small, little male. And there are quite a few harbor porpoises down in that region, just north of uh, Point Arena Lighthouse. They swim around in that bay. Um, harbor porpoises are doing well. You can usually see them if you look really closely. They are fast um, and kind of hard to see. But um, the reason that I'm not destroyed by this image is she died in a, for, of natural causes. Like she was pregnant, she just bit a little bit off, bit a little bit too much off, more than she could uh, bit down her her gullet, more than she could chew. Thank you. <laughs> um, but except really, they don't chew, so they swallow them whole. Thank you. <laughs> Swallowed it whole. <laughs> exactly. Um, 
here's another kind of interesting, um, and this is a mystery solved, which for years I've been reporting to Sue because I can't say it's a coyote that's killing these harbor seals. I know it. Sue will say, nope, nope. Uh, it's, yeah, I need it to say, so I'll report it to Sue Pemberton and I'll say, uh, injuries consistent with coyote predation. So we've been saying that for years, consistent with coyote predation. It looks like it is a coyote. It, it They always bring it to the same spot on the ice plant. There's a lot of consistencies to these kills. Um, you can see the little harbor seal pup is turned inside out there. So we'll right side it out and then do an estimated standard length, which would be from the tip of the nose to the tip of the tail. These little pups are probably a day old or two days old. And then here you can see those canine um, marks in the skull. And then there's a coyote track even, but we were still saying injuries consistent with coyote kill until the coyote kid came to help us. This is Frankie Garrity, a graduate student from UC Santa Cruz, who's working on kind of the terrestrial and marine mammal interface along the coast, all up and down the coasts. Um, and he brought his camera traps up to McCarricker State Park and set the camera up on his last night here. He finally got a coyote in the camera trap, dragging a little harbor seal pup up onto the ice plant. And that was enough for us to finally say coyote predation, which <clears throat> it's brutal, I know, but it's also nature. So um, keep that in mind when we get into this next, the next series of slides. Um, it is nature. We, uh, historically, grizzly bear, bears kept pinnipeds off the shores. And then the grizzly bears were hunted out. And then when I moved here in the 70s, you didn't see mountain lion or coyote or very few bears because there were ranches up and down the coast and they kept those bigger predators at bay. McCarricker was a, was a ranch. And so really there weren't that many coyotes around. Now it's a state park, we visit it, we protect it. Those bigger predators are protected. We kind of co-mingle, co-live with them and their numbers are getting better. And we're seeing them more often, as we all know. Sue's got mountain lions in her yard almost every night. And uh, I've got a bear in my yard most nights. We all know the story, right? So um, it's interesting. And Frankie's looking at that interface between the pinnipeds and the and the predators. So thank you, Frankie. And he'll be up this year as well. So I gave you that so that you can say, okay, it's nature <laughs> taking its course. But now we're going to get into human interaction, or we call it HI. Um, this was reported out on 10 Mile Beach. It's a dragnet. And within the dragnet, there is a pinniped here. And this is Lizeth, our one of our interns, who's now at Montana State University studying wildlife biology. And our team went out, hiked out there. You can see Jeff Jacobson all tangled up in a massive amount of nets. So this is the kind that goes on those spools behind the boats. Um, not my favorite kind of approach to fishing at all. Um, and then we did a bit of sleuthing and found that it, you know, she's solidly stuck into the tangle of those nets. And not only was she entangled, she also was shot. So there was evidence of, of being shot here, you can see in the skull. And, you know, no fisherman really wants to catch a sea lion or an orca. It's not their intention. They're, they're out there fishing and this happens. And so the gunshot could be a mercy killing so that the, the animal didn't struggle there in the nets. Uh, but I don't really know whether the, you know, I don't know exactly how this scenario played out, but it was pretty brutal. Um, and her skull is back there on the table there with the netting that we collected. So she's a young female stellar sea lion. And, you know, we have a lot of California sea lions. You can hear them. Stellar sea lions are a little bit more rare in this part of the coast. We don't see them that often. Um, and when we do, we get really excited. Beautiful animals. They're way more numerous the further north you go. So if you go to sea lion caves or along the Oregon coast or even 
just at Crescent City and Arcata, there's more stellar sea lions up there. Um, anyway, that was that was a rough one. And um, and then we this is all about sleuthing. So we did get this. Um, I like to call this a blob. And it really was a blob. Um, we got a call to head down to Irish Beach. Somebody said something large and white is floating in and it looks like it's going to land. And sure enough, it landed. Um, but really, it was an unidentifiable blob of what was a large cetacean. So it wasn't a dolphin or a pinniped or a, or it was it was big. Um, and we went down and what was cool about this is there was so little of the whale there that we weren't distracted by a whale when we were doing our sleuthing. We had to really dig deep into finding clues on this animal. And we worked all day. It was kind of in the surf, rolling, not really rolling around very much. Um, you can see Sarah in this picture, she's got her arms outstretched on the only area that was intact. And there were a few bones in there, and that is actually called the peduncle. It's the area of the whale that moves the fluke up and down, so the business part of a whale. Um, and that's what Sarah's got her arms out spread over the peduncle area. So the fluke is missing, and everything forward of about the pelvic region was buried and twisted and so we left that day not knowing what kind of whale it was it was literally just like a blob but we did dig around and we found the pelvic bone which is something that for the california academy's collection if we do respond to a large whale we do want to try to get those pelvic bones and those will go into the collection so we found one pelvic bone um, i think we found a few chevron bones um, but that wasn't going to tell us still what kind of whale it was. There was no way we could tell it what kind of whale it was. And then the next day we went down this odd shaped thing is actually the rostrum. So the very tip of the nose of the whale was twisted and tucked near. Um, well, I'll show you the next picture. So it wasn't until two days later when we went back down again to Sleuth. Here you can see me with the with that peduncle area and then really just a mess of stringy bits of what was once a whale. And still, I said, Sue, I think it's a it's a humpback. And she said, well, what makes you say that? There's nothing there that tells me that it's a humpback. So it's not a humpback until it's a humpback. <laughs> That's just how she rolls. She's the best teacher. Um, and here's what we found when we went down two days later. And so we were able to say, look, we were able to identify this whale as a humpback whale. Um, and the rostrum is actually tucked up and twisted right near where Sarah's digging around there. So it was just, it had been tumbled and tossed by the waves um, and really it deteriorated. Um, so it took some, some serious sleuthing there. And we don't really know how big it was. We were able to see by the vertebrae, the vertebrae were not, they didn't have the epiphyseals fused, so it was probably a young animal, but we don't know if it was a male or a female. What did you see that told you it was a humpback? This view, anybody out there? <laughs> We've got that big peck fin, yeah. And yeah, the scalloped peck fin, but we couldn't even get a measurement and we went, Sarah went down to try to find it and it had gone. So we didn't get a measurement on the peck fin. That would have been really helpful. Just even measuring different parts of it might have given us some more clues as to how old the animal was. So we got that great scalloped peck fin to tell us that it was a humpback. And getting into a little bit more sleuthing. Um, this is one of our interns this year. This is um, Shirlene Flores, who's a senior at the Noyo High School. And she and Madison are our two newest interns. They're both kind of pursuing the medical field. So they're getting to do some necropsy and um, digging in and some sleuthing in and paying into paying attention to details. Um, and kind of, I said, imagine you're charting. So we're charting every one of these animals that we're, that we're getting. So uh, she was helping me clean this skull and she said, what's this? And she found these two little plastic round things here in the mesh bag that contained the skull of a California sea lion. And I said, and that's why we pour these 
everything through this strainer so that we can pick up any little tiny thing. We don't want to miss that because we're really looking for human interaction in these. That's part of you get the species, you get the length, you get the sex, you get all these different things, and it, you look for human interaction. It's an important part of what we're reporting. So good job, Shirlene. She did find these two little plastic, and I think they are some kind of plastic pellet, and they're not really meant to penetrate. They're maybe a hazing tool mm -hmm. to get the sea lions away from the fishing boats. Um, that's we. There'll be more on that. So these are our volunteers and interns. Here you have Sarah working with Madison and Shirlene, and they're working on this little northern fur seal, um, measuring it and practicing, seeing what they can learn about how to respond in the field. And then here's last year's intern, uh, Lizeth, helping to um, drill some holes in a, the, the smelly whale back there, the beaked whale, which I think you can probably all smell. We're trying to get it degreased, and so we drilled little holes in it to try to get some of that oil out. Um, and here's Madison working on a river otter specimen with one of our volunteers. Um, and Caden digging into a big old sea lion and collecting the skull. And again, our beach response team there um, with that stellar sea lion. So great opportunity for um, these students who are interested in field biology. Um, and, you know, maybe they're going into medical field, but they can get introduced to what a body looks like and all of that. Um, here's another intern, Robin Fernandez, who is doing, um, he's an artist and he drew these pictures. He was able to take pictures of the skeletons that we have at the Discovery Center and then flesh them out through work on his iPad. Extremely talented. And that sea lion picture, he looked at one of those guys that's barking out there and uh, and uh, just freehanded it. Amazingly talented young man. And we'll get into hopefully leave you on a cheery note here. This is a really big California sea lion that um, was on one of the docks across the way here. And he had a run in with a really big shark. And so he had this massive crescent that probably was that that big, a couple feet wide from smile, smile line to smile line. And there was nothing we could do about that animal. He's just too big to rescue. We wouldn't be able to get our gear down there. He'd probably flop off the dock. So we're like, well, we're just going to have to walk away from this one. And miraculously, he healed up. He was allowed, the, the, the boat folks and the harbor master were like, let's just let him, leave him alone and maybe he'll be all right. And sure enough, he healed up and he's been seen now swimming around the harbor and he's got that tattoo of the shark bite on his side and he's still huge. Um, not the case for this other animal here. This one, you can see again, that really big shark. Um, we call it Sharktober. Um, and the sharks are still around. We just had a couple shark bit vid victims just last week. Um, neither one of them made it and neither did this one here. So, and some good news for our rescue team. We call ourselves FBO or the Marine Mammal Center Rescue Team. Many of our Noyo Center volunteers are also rescue volunteers with the Marine Mammal Center. I myself have been doing it for 20 years and it's really what got me a six sea lion I reported it, I followed the volunteers, I became a volunteer and it really got me into this passion that I have going. But I was really curious about what was, what their issues were. Why were they sick? What was wrong with them? And that's when I went back to school and studied marine science. So this, I would like to introduce you to Slinger. And Slinger was one that was rescued up here in Port Bragg. And he was our sole survivor of all the California sea lions that we rescued, Slinger made it and he made it to be released. And um, this is a release picture, photo taken by the, by the uh, Marine Mammal Center crew releasing him. But what I love is this other picture where there were four being released. Slinger took off, went out into the bay, and then like five minutes later came back and kind of barked at the other ones that were just getting released. And then they did this nose to nose bonding. They, and it just made my heart sing. It was really, really. And just a reminder to everybody, I'm going to say it too many times. If you see a live marine mammal, 
on the beach when you're out there and you're unsure if it should be reported or you're sure it should be reported, please don't call the Noyo Center. Please don't call me. Call the Marine Mammal Center. Just keep that number 415-289-SEAL. Um, call directly. We've had some um, publications recently that got the numbers wrong, which was really unfortunate, but please just keep the Marine Mammal Center's number with you. And I had somebody ask today, well, I wasn't sure if it was sick. Well, that's okay. You don't have to be sure. If it's, if it's a sea lion out on a beach alone, or you're feeling concerned, or you want to know more, call the Marine Mammal Center and they'll send us out into the field. We can't respond unless you call into dispatch and then they'll send us out. So important stuff. Even if we don't need a rescue, we can still go out and assess it. Yeah, and I'll get it to you afterwards. It's on our website. I've got some cards with it on it. So yeah, I will definitely. <laughs> um, all right, and who, who else and what else? We've got our mola mola. We've got some interesting little plastic army guys, some trash from far and wide, um, a cartilaginous part of a ray or shark. I'm not even sure what that is. Octopus and then the pyrosomes. So our beach surveyors often take pictures of what they, oh yeah, and the octopus is right in the middle. Um, our beach surveyors will take pictures of things that they come across uh, of interest. And they'll also report the live and the dead marine mammals. And here's a just a lovely picture. One of Richard's favorite big sea lions that actually sunk our little rowboat. <laughs> We're kind of, I mean, that guy's huge. And uh, now they're parked, uh, posted up on the, on the neighbor's dock. And then a uh, harbor seal and her pup, that nose to nose bonding thing gets me every time. Um, and here's some more nice pictures. Um, Neil Hershey was over on the coast and this was a gray whale right off of Spring Ranch that was literally like surfing in those waves. And Sarah Bogart got a picture of a happy smiling harbor seal, mm -hmm. fat and sassy in the rookery down off of Point Arena. So get out there and look at the marine mammals. Often people say, how do you stay cheerful? How do you, how do you cope? And I cope by going out and watching nature, watching the live ones. And it, it just, it's like refills the cup, so to speak. Um, so huge thanks to our survey team that gets out on the beaches every two weeks. Many of you are here, you know who you are, you know how much you're appreciated, you know how important the work that you are doing by removing tons of trash from the beaches um, and committing thousands of hours to surveying these beaches from, uh, I think, Elk all the way up through Westport. So thank you to all of you. Um, and then also to our beach response team, who's Sarah Sundberg, Jeff Jacobson, Anna Antonovich, Richard, Trey, Leah, and Karen Berlsheimer. Um, when a whale comes ashore, this team is activated and will go out and um, respond to whatever is out there. And also, if a whale comes ashore and it's possible, we will call and see if we can get Sarah and Mo up here, um, or Sue and Mo up here, um, or the Marine Mammal Center. We all work together. And last year, we had um, Cal Poly Humboldt, Alice and Louie came down. We worked on a humpback whale together. So it's really, we have our different sections, but we really are working together. And um, so it's good that we have a team that can respond here locally if one of those other teams can't come, but we also have that backup. And this year we're gonna do a lot more training with large whale response. Um, and thank you to the photographers. And I just have to, to give a nod to my mother and father who um, were ski bums when I was born and uh, pretty much raised me outside um, and, allowed me to explore for hours and that insatiable curiosity was fostered with through them and uh, they're watching me from wherever. And this is just another special thank you to the cleanup crew. <laughs> Sarah Bogart took this beautiful picture of the turkey vultures together. I love that photo. And uh, there we go. All right, well, um, I think, thank you everybody. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you so much. I think we'll let our Zoom audience in the chat if anybody has any questions. Michael is going to kind of let me know. And then we'll we'll have a Q&A with all of you in the room. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah, you can talk. When? Uh, oh, no. Um, um, just the permission of Mr. Mayor, I noticed the, the back note was already extruded, so it's already dead. I think that was a response to the bear picture from earlier, that one on the sea line. I made a comment earlier, so I hope that it was Hi. made that comment. Attention to detail. <laughs> Sue noticed that the baculum was coming out on that sea lion that the bear was grabbing. So that, thank you, Sue. And then maybe ask Charles Rand. I think he's maybe trying to talk. Maybe ask him if he has any questions. Oh, Charles Rand, you're in the house. Thank you. Hello, love. Did hey. you have a Yeah, hey. I, have, I have a question. Have you guys got cameras on the sperm whale fall? Oh, great question, Charles. We don't have cameras on the sperm whale fall, but we do, however, go out in our boat and put our ROV and send our ROV uh -huh. down to explore that. And uh, we haven't seen it recently. Uh, we need to get out there. We need to get a weather window when we can get the equipment out there, when it's not rough and when the water's clear. So more on that. Stay tuned, definitely. And I'm so grateful. Charles has known me all my life, and I am touched deeply that he is here in the Zoom audience. Big and hug. Can... And me too. <laughs> and Rianti. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I don't see anything else right now from the Zoom. Uh, just, just a lot of thank yous and plaudits. And oh, sweet. Everybody on there. So I'll keep looking, but if you want to open up to hear. Excellent. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions here? What? Oh, they're they're okay. We we can edit that out. That's all. It's fine. Did anybody in the audience have any questions? Yeah. The uh, Farallon Islands is the main helping ground for the sea lions that we have, right? No, actually, the main pupping area for California sea lions, where most of them breed, is further south on the Channel Islands. But you're exactly right. The Farallon Islands does have a fairly big rookery there as well. Well, I've heard that in that area, radioactive waste don't get back from the 50s on. Have you heard that? Is that true? For the Channel Islands, yes, that is true. Yeah. Not the Farallon. Not the Farallons, although the Farallons probably have some of their own issues, but nothing like the Channel Islands. And that was um, an expose that was done by the Los Angeles Times, a couple of, of, um, of people there, Suzanne Rust did. Anyway, it, it was, it was uh, really came out in a big way through a story that the Los Angeles Times did on that dump of, of DDT and barrels and barrels of toxic waste. That does what was that question? Yeah, Sue, let me repeat that. Um, the question about the dumping grounds near the Channel Islands of the of the barrels of toxic chemicals that were dumped. There are barrels dumped out at the Fairlands. As well. Okay. Mm -hmm. So okay. It's a dirty little secret that a lot of people don't talk about, but they are there. They they do leach. That's why we still um we find DDT in, in um, Pinniped still. That's been banned for 40 years and we're still finding it in, uh, in uh, marine mammals. So that, that, that is part of what speaks to the importance of the work that we're all doing is that even through rescue and through response that these animals are being looked at and being um that counted and being you know if they're rescued live that's kind of an interesting one that at the marine mammal center this is kind of shocking but the live rescues that of california sea lions that go to the marine mammal center 25 percent of them have urogenital cancer that is linked to that exposure to toxic chemicals so pretty brutal and then through uh, our work up here, we rescued a mammal, a California sea lion here in the harbor. He went to the Marine Mammal Center. 
where um, his bones sparked the interest of the pathology team there. He had strange lesions and whatnot on his bones. Um, and he tested positive for high levels of fluoro fluoride. Um, and then two animals after that, that stranded deceased up here, had these weird osteo issues as well. And we collected those bones and they were tested for the fluoride content and were also high. And Michelle Blackwell did a little story on that at our local KZYX News. Um, and it's also in a scientific paper published by uh, the pathology team down there. Um, so important stuff comes out of this. We're, we're not just documenting, but we're getting some pretty cool science just scratching the surface and hopefully sparking more questions and curiosity. Do you have any? <laughs> We've got sea lions making so much noise out here. I don't know if you Zoom folks can hear them, but they're making a lot of noise. Uh, any other questions from the audience here? Is yeah. California sea lions that I know of, I've only seen pups once, and it was in a bad year for domoic acid toxicity. They were sort of pupping in different places up and down the coast on docks and whatnot, but there um, aren't pupping areas on the Mendocino coast that we know of um, for sea lions. We have the harbor seals and further north, maybe some stellar sea lions, um, but the Farallons, they're, they're there and Onion Nuevo, they're there. And then the majority is down on the Channel Islands. Sir, there's a, actually a question from Sarah Bogart. Have you seen the osteopathy toxicity in NESC back in NESC? Uh, no, Northern Elephant Seals, no, no. Um, but, you know, they're just, like I said, scratching the surface on that one. It's really not, um, not been looked at, but you can link to, you can read the paper if you go to our website and, and there's a link to the paper there. Um, that's Maggie Martinez and Poreg Duignan from the Marine Mammal Center have been doing that, uh, working on that um, paper. 